Shalom and welcome to another teaching from Messianic Delaware. My name is Jerry Mitchell, and I want to thank you for studying with us as we dig through the language, the culture, and the history to reveal the truth in the words of our Creator. Today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to begin a series on this, and you'll see why in a moment. We've talked about this in our fellowship, and, and we've thought this is a good place to, to start, and uh, you'll see as we dig into this what we're looking at. But the first thing I want to look at, and you've probably heard a lot about this. We've actually done a teaching on this. Uh, Carl Bartel did a teaching on this a few weeks ago. October 23rd, 2017. Now this is the beginning of August as I record this. And I, I have thought about it, I've prayed about it, I've looked at it. And I need to make a prediction, and I need to specify this is a prediction, not a prophecy. Okay, this is something that what I'm going to tell you is simply my prediction. And it's not exactly what's going to happen. It's what I am predicting is based on a lot of things, because history has a tendency to repeat itself. So let's look at my prediction. I predict that no matter what happens or doesn't happen on October 23rd, 2017, the agnostic and atheist, atheistic communities will declare there is no God and we cannot trust our Bible. Now, that's a little tongue-in-cheek and that's a little sarcastic, yes. But anybody with a biblical background should be able to say, if we don't understand the prophecy and we really won't be able to understand it until after it happens and we know that something's going to happen we just don't know exactly how it all fits together yet because that's the way prophecy works we have to the event has to occur and then we can look back and see how it fits and what's going on now those in the Messianic and Hebrew Roots communities are, are pretty certain that we know Yeshua is not coming back on October 23rd, 2017. I mean, that's a given. But the atheistic communities are going to be saying, well, Jesus didn't return. The Bible can't be trusted. There's no God. That's what's going to occur. It happens every time. So be ready for that. My prediction is this is going this is going to be the reaction of the atheistic and agnostic communities, and we need to be prepared with a response. And our response should be, nobody said Jesus was coming back. Nobody said the world was going to end. Nobody said there's going to be turmoil in the streets. There's going to be famines and floods and... That stuff already happens. There's already tribulation. There's already Christians being martyred. There's already people being persecuted no matter what they believe. There's people being persecuted simply for being people. So as we enter into this, this phase of getting ready for this October 23rd event, relax breathe. There's going to be a lot of people that are very upset when they wake up on October 24th and the world didn't end. Okay? Those people need to hear the truth. They need to know who their creator is. They need to know who their savior is and they need to understand that God will do exactly the things he said he's going to do. Now, I know that the agnostic communities say, well, if the Mayan calendar would have been just a few years later, they would have seen this coming. Well, maybe that's why they stopped when they stopped. Because they knew that God would take over at some point. He's going to show us something. And it doesn't matter what happens. The response 
from the people who don't believe, the response from the people who reject their creator is going to be the same. And that's sad. That's really sad. But now, let's turn our attention to Matthew chapter 5. And this is really interesting. I have spoken to this before, but I've never really dug into it with you. And quite honestly, <clears throat> I don't know how far I'm going to be able to get with you. Um, I can dig into this a lot deeper in the fellowship because we can go down some of those rabbit trails that I have to avoid when I am recording this uh, simply because of time constraints. I want to keep these teachings as close to 30 minutes as I can uh, so you don't get bored and so that it, it keeps me on track. But the good thing about being in the fellowship together is we can go down those rabbit trails because often these teachings last an hour and a half or two hours. Just because we have that kind of interaction, people like to, to input and we encourage that. Matthew chapter 5 <clears throat> begins, Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. Now this is after he was baptized. He comes out of the wilderness. He's been tempted. And it says, After seeing the multitudes, he went up to the mountain, and when he was set, he had sat down on a rock, on the ground, whatever he would sat in, sat on. His disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now this is interesting, because the disciples were the only ones there to hear this teaching. Most Bibles will have a title for this, Matthew chapter 5, and it says, A Sermon on the Mount. Well, that implies, or that gives us the impression that there were hundreds of people there. There is a movie, a Monty Python movie called The Life of Brian, and it's described as Yeshua sitting on this rock and he's teaching and, and the, there's so many people there that they keep hollering back what he's teaching. And it's, it's quite hilarious. It's one of my favorite parts of the film. Because, you know, as he's saying, blessed are the peacemakers. And they're like, blessed are the cheesemakers. If you get a chance to, to watch it, it's an interesting film if you like British comedy. But that's the impression we get from the title in the Bible. And the point I want to make with that is, it's wrong. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to understand what it says because it says the disciples were the only ones there. They were the only ones hearing this and he taught them. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, he begins his teaching. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, where does he come up with this? Is it something new? Is this a new idea? No, it's not. It comes from Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where's the house that you built for me? And where's the place of rest? For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man I will look. Even to him that is poor of a contrite that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. To this man I will look. To this man. What man? To the man who has a broken spirit, a broken heart, who needs to connect the Spirit inside of Him with the Holy Spirit that our Creator surrounds us with. And, and trembles at the very Word of God. Understands Jeremiah when, it's, when, when Jeremiah is recorded as saying God spoke to him and said, if you will hear my voice, if you will obey my commands you will be my people and I will be your God that's who he's talking about here now this verse has been twisted to mean a lot of things blessed are the poor wait a minute 
if blessed are the poor, how did Abraham, how did Job be blessed? Because they were rich people. They had a lot of wealth. They had a lot of wealth. But they were blessed. Job was even blessed with an extra 20 years on earth. So don't let these fancy preachers talk you into you have to give everything away. That's complete nonsense. You have to have the right spirit. You have to have the right attitude. You have to have the right heart. And that's what he begins with. Verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now this is really interesting. It comes from Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. He's going to free those who are bound to what? Sin. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. To comfort all that mourn. Now that's really, really interesting because what are we going to see? What are we going to see? In Luke 4, as Yeshua begins his ministry, he hands, he is handed the scroll of Isaiah, it begins 417, they, and there they delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened a book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the deliverance to the captives, and recover the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Slightly different in the way Luke records it. And verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And there he closes the book. He never finishes. He never finishes. He is there to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, we, I'm going to send you down just a little short rabbit trail here because there's a lot of things we can interpret from this. He's handed a scroll of Isaiah that's written in Hebrew. That means Yeshua and other people in that era could read Hebrew even though they spoke Aramaic generally in the population. The Hebrew language is what was used in the temple and in the synagogues still is today. It was never a completely lost language. They may have lost some uh, certain definitions and some uh, that language may have evolved slightly. <clears throat> but overall, that language was always used in the temple and it was always used in the synagogues throughout the last 2,000 years. Enough of that rabbit trail. You can do that study on your own. Matthew chapter 5 Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Wow. Now we need to be careful, and I, I'm hoping to be able to get to this meek here in just a second, because it might not be what you think it is. Isaiah twenty nine nineteen. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Zephaniah 2 3 Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, that it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Hmm. You should seek righteousness and seek meekness, so you will be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Psalm 30. I'm sorry. Psalm 37, I got a little bit ahead of myself. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So let's look at this word meek. Now, according to Daniel Webster in 1828, mild of temper, soft, gentle, 
not easily provoked or irritated, yielding, giving to forbearance under injuries. Now the man Moses was very meek above all men. That comes from Numbers 12.3. Appropriately humble in an evangelical sense, submissive to the divine will, submissive to God's will, not proud, self-sufficient or refractory, not peevish and apt to complain of divine dispensations. Hmm. Now, a lot of times we get this, this idea that meek means that somebody can just step all over you. They, people just walk all over you and you don't care. That's not what the word meek meant when it was translated into English. Meek does not mean that you you are always just this little helpless kitten that people just take advantage of continuously. You are mild of temper. You are not easily provoked. That doesn't mean when you're backed into a corner you don't fight. That doesn't mean when you see things that aren't right you stand up for those less fortunate. That doesn't mean that if you... That doesn't mean you won't fight when you have to. You don't go looking for it, but when it finds you, you fight righteously. The meek will inherit the earth because they will submit to God's will. Interesting. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Oh my. That's what we're trying to do here, isn't it? We, we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Proverbs 10, 24. The fear of the wicked shall come upon him, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. The fear of the wicked they will get. They will always be afraid, but the desire of the righteous will be given. Oh my. I, I could go down so many rabbit trails with that, and I probably will when I, when I present this to the fellowship. Proverbs twenty one twenty one: He that followeth after righteousness and mercy finds life. Also finds righteousness and also finds honor but you've got to hunger for it. You've got to thirst for it. You've got to dig for it. Jeremiah 31, 25, For I have sat satiated the weary soul. I've satisfied the weary soul. I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Isaiah 55, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. And he that has no money, come and buy and eat. Come by wine and milk without money and without price. Wasn't it Yeshua who stood up and said, If you thirst, come to me, I will give you water? Oh my. Oh, if you could be here Friday for this. Oh my. I can go places. Psalm 63. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. He's hunting for something here. David remembers when he was actually out of Israel. He was out of the land and couldn't find God in other lands. Psalm 107, 9. He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Now this isn't the end. This is just where I chose to, to stop. There's other things. Psalm 42 is the deer longs for the water, so my soul longs for thee. If you're hungry, if you're thirsty, if you're seeking the truth, if you're digging through the language, you're digging through the culture, you're digging through the history to find out exactly what our Creator has for us and more specifically has for you personally, this describes you. And you will, you will eat, you will drink, 
You will have your questions answered. They may not always be the answers you want to hear, but you will get a divine answer. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, instead of looking at specific scriptures to this, I chose to go another way with this one because I want you to understand that even though people can be not presented in a positive light in the Bible, they can also be merciful. Pharaoh, when he released Joseph, showed him mercy. Not only did he show Joseph mercy, but he knew he needed Joseph. He understood that Joseph had something he needed. So he brings him out of prison. And look what happened. Because Pharaoh had one act of mercy. There are so many examples of this in Scripture. Not only were righteous people were merciful, but where the unrighteous people showed mercy. And the Hebrews benefited so much from that. I will let you dig through that on your own. Second Samuel. It came to pass when David came to Manheim and Shobi, the son of Nahash and Rabbah, of the children of Ammon, and Machir, the son of Amiel, of Lodabar, and Barzillah, the, Gile the Gileadite of Rogalim, brought beds, basins, and earthen vessels, and wheat, and barley, and flour, and parched corn, and beans, and lentils, and parched pulse, and honey, and they throwed these blessings at their feet. They showed mercy. Second Samuel 22 and 28. And the afflicted people you will save, but your eyes are upon the haughty that, they, that you will bring them down. You see the difference. Proverbs 11. The merciful man does good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Did you catch that? When you show mercy, you do good. But when you're cruel, you trouble your own flesh. The liberal souls shall be made fat, and he that waters shall be watered himself. You that you know, some people might want to call that karma. Some say other things, but honestly. You reap what you sow, don't you? And Psalm 18, 25, With a the merciful they will show thyselves merciful. With an upright man you will show yourself upright. These are the first things that Yeshua taught. He didn't open with the same opening that Jehovah did as he came down on Mount Sinai. When God presented himself at Mount Sinai, there was smoke and there was fire and there was just this huge noise. The shofars were blowing. Everything was happening. And he shouts down, I am Jehovah, your God. He confirms that they said yes, and now he's saying yes. And he begins with a list of do's and don'ts. This time when Yeshua begins teaching just that small group that he's going to send out to teach others, he begins by saying, you've got to get your heart right. You've got to get your heart right. Because he knows, he understands that even though the people took three days to get ready to hear God at Mount Sinai, they weren't ready. They thought they were ready, but they were getting things cleaned up. They were getting things spotless. They wanted to present an outside view, and they thought they were ready. Yeshua is saying, get your inside ready. 
Because if you don't have the heart, if you don't have the soul, if you don't have the spirit that's seeking what God has to offer, and more importantly, if you don't want the things that God wants to give you, if you don't want the things God wants to give you, it's not going to go well for you. You need to change you need to change your attitude so that it reflects in your life. Your life needs to display itself the way that your creator designed you to live. And that is far more reaching than don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't commit adultery. It means that you embrace everything. There is a word in Hebrew, mayod. And it's often translated as very. You know, tov mayod. Very good. Or actually, tov meaning good. Very meaning mayod. And... It's in the Shema when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your myod, all your very, all your everything. And that's what Yeshua is getting to here. You've, you've got to use that everything, that very, that whatever makes you you needs to be working on these things. So that you can receive, so that you are ready to receive the blessings that your Creator wants you to have. Let me close with this. Just because you look good on the outside, just because you smile when you're hurting, just because you dress nicely people will look at your eyes people will look at your face and they will understand that you're hurting they will understand something's wrong in Messiah Delaware we've, Delaware we've talked about what does someone look like today are we recognizable as people who follow Yeshua and it goes so much more than wearing tzitzit. It goes so much deeper than being respectful, respectful to others. It goes so much more than just simply looking the part. Because I know a lot of people who go to churches a lot of times a week sometimes, you know, often throughout the week. I know pastors who do not display an outward appearance of being a disciple of Yeshua. And that's sad to say. But if you're going to look the part, then your heart has to be right. If you're going to act the part, your heart has to be right. And that's what Yeshua is teaching here. He doesn't begin with a list of do's and don'ts. He doesn't begin with the instructions. He begins by saying, get ready to receive the instructions I'm going to give you. Matthew chapter 5 is what I like to consider Disciple Training 101. It's boot camp for disciples. It's getting us ready from the inside out, not from the outside in. And I hope you join me next time on Messianic Delaware as we continue to dig through the language and the culture and the history. We're going to continue with Matthew next time. Until then, Shalom.